Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. This episode is brought to you by Mural, a digital workspace for visual collaboration. At Voltage Control, we use Mural to facilitate engaging and productive meetings and workshops from anywhere. Mural gives teams the means, methods, and freedom to collaborate visually. Use their suite of facilitation superpowers to control the virtual room and solve tough problems as a team with their pre-built templates and guided methods. To see for yourself why companies like IBM, Atlassian, and E-Trade rely on Mural, start your 30-day trial at mural.co. That's M-U-R-A-L dot C-O. Today, I'm with Solomon Masala, co-founder at Source Consulting Group, where he is lucky enough to have found a soulmate and life partner with whom he can create a business that serves people with zero toxic byproducts. He is also the author of One Two Let's All Groove and Rhythm Play. Welcome to the show, Solomon. Thank you, Douglas. It's so great to be here with you again. Appreciate the uh, patience that you had in, in the invitation. And always an honor to be able to uh, dive into this amazing conversation with you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got your start in this amazing work that you do. Thank you. <laughs> how I got my start. Um, well, you know, as you've said before, it's, I don't know anybody who's went to school and said, hey, I'm taking, you know, a master's in facilitation. Um, and, and in the intro that you, you sent, you uh, read there, the fact that uh, I found a soulmate and I was lucky enough to do that work. I think really my facilitation started in the sense that I had to learn a lot about myself and who I was and the impact I have in having that sense of deep intimate relationship. I mean, that's one of the best places to learn how to facilitate because it always starts with me and my own self-reflection in the process of it. So um, I got started in huh, the self-reflective process there, as well as just getting started in, I was shoved out into it, man. <laughs> it was not something that I set out to do. Uh, my background initially was education and I was, a, I was afraid of adults. I was like, what? I, I can get out there with adults and facilitate and do that kind of thing. I work with kids um, and I was lucky enough to have some mentors uh, out of the experiential learning element, an, an organization called On the Edge, Phil Bryson, and then amazing other mentors, Gruffy, Gruffy Clough, who was part of the Grove back in the day, a gentleman named Paul, uh, Tom Leahy. And these folks saw something in me and just kept kind of calling me out, you know, like, hey, you're going to do this. Or as we do this particular group, I want you to facilitate here. And, um, you know, I was a teacher. I did, I did curriculum development for years. And the Department of Education in Colorado said, all right, now you got to go train people to do this. So I just kept <laughs> being put in these situations where I had to step out and learn. And fortunately, I had incredible people to watch. Um, and and that's that's kind of how I got started, man. So when you think about those moments that, um, that kind of punctuate your journey, what do you think that you're the most proud of? Mm, what a great question. First of all, I think I'm the most proud of being willing to just do it. There are definitely moments where 10 minutes, five minutes before the program, I would just think to myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> be so easy to be a coder. I could just do my thing and not have to interact with people. Um, and that's not a diss on coders at all. Your work is really hard. Uh, and But just that courage, I think I'm most proud that I kept putting myself out there and so grateful that I had mentors who kept helping me understand that facilitation wasn't a game show, that the sense of knowing myself, 
the sense of being able to self-reflect, the sense of being able to bring vulnerability to the experience was a huge part of how I helped a group move, how I would help a group through its process, and how I could really serve the humans in front of me uh, doing what they wanted to do. I think I, that's probably the, the most pride that I have is just finding that courage. But that really came from support of other people. I can't say that was just on me. Yeah, you know, I think I think the, 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 the thing is, is people can bring you, can point that out to you. But the fact that you followed through on it and 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 because it's hard to fight that inner critic and oh, say man. no this is important work and <laughs> yeah. um and so thank you for doing that because the stuff you bring to the world is really important and whenever i see a master facilitator that's doing great stuff i'm just super grateful that they exist mm, thank you thank you likewise <laughs> likewise and so it's interesting you were saying that you you're you're kind of identified more as someone who you know, works with children. So making that shift to facilitating adults and, and businesses was a little strange at first. And now you come full circle because you're, you're now facilitating children, which, it, <laughs> and, you know, it's fascinating to me if I under, and I'd love to, you know, we haven't talked a ton. We've talked over email about this new role that you have. Right. And I find it very fascinating because it seems very, very necessary and important work and at the same time as i hear i'm unpacking this live but the thing that crosses my mind is that you know you were teaching children and then you began to facilitate adults and mm -hmm. see problems and patterns and now you're f teaching children to avoid those problems and patterns <laughs> that you're facilitating around yes that's right on there are so many elements of group dynamics that I came across in working with adults that to me, one of the things that I often say is I become who I practice being. I, I didn't make that up, but I think those are the words that I've put around it. And that as I watch uh, adults in group dynamics, it just becomes so obvious. These are the patterns that they have, that I have as an adult have grooved into my neurology so much that I almost become unaware that I'm doing something. And that's, that's what practice does, right? I get so good at something. I don't have to really think about it, but the truth is I can get good at anything, including something that's as degenerative as it is generative. Like I can get really good at bad habits. And so working with children gives me an opportunity to begin introducing the power of I become who I practice being so that as they're wiring this neurology, there's more awareness on, well, who do I want to be? And what's the impact of who I am on a group experience? And what's the impact of who I am? And how can I reflect on that and really give myself, build that muscle of internal intervention? so that I can continue to be somebody who is the person I want to be and, and become more aware of the habits that might bring down group process. Now, that's not to say that adults can't learn, um, but it sometimes takes a little bit more because there's been so much practice of this is who I am and so much attachment and commitment to that, that it just takes a little bit longer to make that change. Whereas in young people, as cl cliche as it sounds, there's still moldability and there's still their own sense of moldability. Like I'm not trying to make them somebody else. I'm trying to reflect, hey, who do you want to be? You have the power and the uh, ability to make those choices. Here's an opportunity. Let's practice that. Well, it reminds me of that quote around the, you know, the interior conditions of the intervener is going to impact the eff effectiveness of the intervention. Mm. And, and when you're, you're talking about this notion mm -hmm. of your internal intervention, that, that really struck a chord with me. Cause we, if we think about the energy we're bringing into the room, that's gonna, it's gonna have a big impact. Huge. Absolutely. And so how much, practice can I bring to becoming aware of what's going on inside me and how that's impacting what's going on externally and how I might be, I think I've said this before, how I might respond rather than react and how much practice I put into 
that sense of what's my body doing right now? What am I feeling? What am I sensing right now? That facilitation is so much not a head trip. It's also a really embodied act because then I'm aware of what I'm feeling, what I'm sensing, how that's impacting what I'm about to say or do. Um, and practicing that to me is part of what helps me do those internal interventions to steer myself at least a little bit more clearer um, from reactivity and helps me remember to take a deep breath in that moment and really listen to what's happening or really feel or sense what's happening and how I might be able to serve it instead of, you know, I'm going to use the word manhandle it, you know, strong arm it somewhere rather than, well, what's really emerging right now? Whether this is a group of children or there's a group of adults, what's really emerging right now that I could serve that would bring this experience to its highest potential. And if I can't feel and sense, if I haven't practiced that internal intervention of pause, then oftentimes I won't necessarily be as effective as I could. Yeah, you know, it's like the pause piece is really fascinating too, especially as a facilitator, because how effective we are at allowing the the beauty or the intelligence of the room to emerge versus mm. in, as I was talking to Keith McCandless earlier and he was talking about mm. we, we should never import best practices. <laughs> and so, Right. And so if we're, especially if we as facilitators, I mean, it's bad enough when the expert in the room is like telling everyone what to do, much less, much less the facilitator, right? Right. It totally. I mean, it's like, yes, there's a plan. Yes, there's a, a quote unquote agenda. But really, my best service is what's emerging right now that's going to bring the highest outcome, the highest good to this particular group as an organism, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's always funny to me when I have participants in, in a workshop that are just so laser focused on the agenda and, and any deviations that are happening from it. Oh man. When it's what I get, that's, that's a type of moderation where if you're, if you're, if your perspective on running good meetings is about creating an agenda, that's just a list of topics and making <laughs> sure we move on when we hit that time frame, right. then, then it can be very jarring, right? Whereas the stuff we do is quite different, the, like embracing the emergent phenomenon and finding the beauty that we never knew could have even, we, we couldn't have anticipated it. Yes. And we have to be fluid with the agenda. And we still want to get through everything, but sure. we have to have some fluidity there. Well, I think managing that tension that you just described, you know, of here's the particular outcome or here are the topics and here's the timeline for these various topics. I think there's how to manage the tension of this is the emergent phenomenon. This is what's really important to this group right here, right now. And then, okay, we also have to end it in a half an hour, 45 minutes. That's where, again, I think that sense of how do I practice literally breathing so I can soften my neurology so I can relax my nervous system and really listen to where is this going? How can I bring it back around? Or how can I really say to the group, we said we needed to end in half an hour, but guess what? This is where we are and this feels juicy or this feels like it's serving or this feels like it's that thing underneath the surface that hasn't been talked about. I don't think we're going to be able to get this done in half an hour and I don't want to rush this process. So let's pause for a moment so we can reframe and then move forward. If I'm just looking at the clock and getting tighter and tighter in my nervous system, <laughs> I'm just going to push this thing or try to make something else happen. That's not what's really happening, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we got to be really cognizant of that. And I want to come back to something that you were saying earlier about working with children and, and how some of those patterns can be, we can kind of mold those a little bit earlier. And mm. it, it reminds me of a, of a word that you brought up in one of our prior conversations. Um, and that was condition. Mm. And it's it really like, it was such a beautiful moment when, when you said that. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a, that's an amazing way to reframe something that could easily be seen as a flaw, as an inadequacy, as a problem. Right. Is and it's not that we're anybody's a bad person. It's sure. just their conditioning has has um, you know, positioned them 
to maybe have dysfunctional behavior or, or do things that are not considerate of others. And so I just wanted to bring that up as a, in a moment of appreciation for you or <laughs> uh, like uh, putting me in that, and giving me that perspective. And, and maybe, maybe you could share a little bit of your, I mean, it's been a year since we talked about that. And so maybe you've got some new thinking, especially in this new climate of, of just the unrest that's in the country that's being fueled by various political endeavors. But, um, but it's currently, there, there's a lot going on and, yeah you know, microaggressions and, you know, uh, how we think about our language and how we show up for people and support people is very top of mind for a lot more people. And I think this, this concept that you share with me around conditioning is, is, is something that could be unpacked a little more. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I love that you framed it in that sense that it's not about somebody having a flaw or a fault, because that's truly a beautiful piece. And I'm one of those people that believes in the spirit of humanity. I truly do. I believe in the heart of humanity. And I also, because I've had to work through it myself, had to work through things I'm conditioned to do, you know? So for instance, someone says something that I don't agree with. If I've watched people react, if I've been told I have to stand up for myself, if I've been told and, and watched people model for me not really listening and understanding and being curious, those are the pieces of conditioning that I take in. Oh, that must be the right way to do it. Oh, I see. And this is what it means to be a man, to stand up and have my voice heard. And so that conditioning gets in the way of me being able to, for instance, get curious when somebody has a different opinion, right? If I'm conditioned to just protect, protect, protect myself, when someone says, you know, no, I, I don't agree with that. Here's how I see things. If I'm conditioned to protect myself and what they said goes against what I've believed, then all of a sudden I no longer have the opportunity for real dialogue, you know, that curiosity that's just like, all right, Man, what that person just said is triggering as all to me here. But but I, I want this to be a real dialogue. I want to learn, right? So if I can pause and take a breath and ask them, so tell me more. Like, how do you see the world and why is this the truth for you? Then I'm back into the art of dialogue. And it's not even about I'm trying to change their mind or they're trying to change my mind. Um, but the, the ability to arrest my conditioning of protect myself, be right, uh, establish my boundaries, you know, all those things. Yes, I need to keep myself safe. But for most dialogues that we have, you know, no one's pointing a gun at my head. There's no weapons being drawn. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but for most dialogues, that's not what's happening. And there's probably plenty of air to breathe <laughs> and I'm probably going to have a meal that evening. So if those three things are not there, then I'm just acting out of my conditioned habitual response. And my mom, who's a, who's a therapist, she calls them chirps, conditioned habitual responses, right? And so if I'm falling back into those, then I'm missing the opportunity to just pause, breathe and say to the other person, so just tell me, unpack this for me. How did you get to that position? Or why is that so important to you? And whether my mind changes or not, there's more humanity that comes into the conversation. And that to me is not being a product of my conditioning. That to me is bending it around so that I can be more in my heart than more from my conditioning. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it makes a ton of sense. It reminds me of an exercise my friend Daniel Stillman does where you're supposed to think about someone who, an issue that you feel that's very triggering for you and that you feel that if, when this comes up and people have this opposite view that it can, that it's very hurtful or, or very just challenging, like, you know, it, it might make you angry or it might make you reactive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you write that down. And then your partner is supposed to read that and then basically come up with a script nice. that takes that opposite <laughs> point of view. And you have to listen to them tell you this. And I've even seen it done, done where 
then you have to live you then you have to role reverse and play that role of the person you dislike <laughs> that's great so you sort of empathize through them through yes. uh, acting and role play yes um, and all these things are really powerful but man i can tell you that it can be really challenging in the moment cuz some sometimes it's stuff's very totally it, it you know it it hits it hits a, a part of you that's soft and vulnerable and you know it it can like boomerang you to a place that's not very it's not a place of control. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why I mentioned those, those three things about the, you know, the weapons and the air and the food, because it can almost seem like in those moments where you get that kind of trigger that it's, mm-hmm. it goes straight to that level of survival. Yes. Like, oh my God, my life's at stake here. When in many situations, it really isn't. I'm not saying there aren't those situations. Those are real. But I'm talking about most of the time when we're in those kinds of dialogues or in those kinds of facilitative moments, those three things, that kind of core survival things, they're not really real. So if I have the capacity, and again, this is where I practice that thing around breathing, Tom Leahy giving us that team breath, you know, that to me is one of those interventions that helps me back away from the physiology, from the amygdala hijack that can start to happen. If what I'm saying to myself is, hey, there's plenty of air. Hey, I'm still going to have a meal. Hey, there's no weapons in the space right now. Let me calm down enough to listen at least, right? Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, in situations that I've been in like that, it's, it's a it's a physiological chemical reaction, you know. Yes. Like your your heart rate can spike instantaneously. <laughs> totally. You know, it's like you don't even notice. There was no there was no shit. Like you go to the gym, and you start working out, and your heart rate slowly rises based yeah. on the intensity. Yeah. But those are situations where your physiology changes, yes. like almost like in a in a micro nanosecond. Yes. And now you're having to deal with this altered physical state. Yes. And the content that's still coming at you because the right. rain didn't stop talking. So now <laughs> right. like you're trying to process what's going on. Plus a deal with like the sweat that's pouring out of your yes. palms. And, exactly. Exactly. You nailed and so it. So regulating that's no small feat. This is why to me, one of the core facilitation practices, one of the core practices as a teacher is somatic awareness is just like, you know, cause the physiology most of the time is going to win if it gets away from me, you know, if those 1300 different neurochemicals start cascading through my system, like that's typically what's going to win unless I've been practicing something else, unless I've been really going for, oh, when I feel that starting to happen, it, it's, oh man, this is a signal. This is a, this is the moment. This is the it's moment to go yet. Yeah, yeah. This is the alert for, oh yeah, breathe. <laughs> yes. This is not the moment for, oh no, it's happening. <laughs> right. This is like, I can rewire. I literally can rewire myself to like, all right, I can feel it in my nerve. I can feel it happening, man. If I can get that aware and that present to feeling my underarms are sweating, my voice and my speaking is trembling. My fingers feel like they want to curl up. Like that's not a like, oh no, I'm going down the tubes. That's a, oh right. I'm feeling, I'm sensing again. Take a breath. Let me come back to some sort of coherence, some sort of regulation. Like that practice is so available, but it does take practice. Like to me, those are the foundational practices of facilitation and teaching is coming back. This is this is where that thing of, you know, people say mindfulness, 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 but man, it's a great tool because it's giving me that sense of me come back to feeling in my body so I can come back to the zone that I want to be in. And I want to, I want to like unpack the mindfulness stuff a little bit too, because I feel like that's a word people throw around and don't right. always know what it means. <laughs> and some people equate it with like Eastern you know, religion and, you know, your yogi practices, et cetera. Right. And I, I love the fact that you are talking a lot about somatic process. And I think that to me, there's a real differentiator there between just like, I'm going to go meditate versus I'm going to go really get in tune mm. with the signals that my body's. Cause if you think about it, our body's a giant antenna. 
<laughs> and people talk about, and that's one of the problems with virtual workshops is because that antenna is not a, a is for better or worse, it's not picking things up. So right, if you're the kind of person right. that gets butterflies in your stomach, <laughs> you know, before a big meeting, you pr that probably doesn't happen on Zoom because you're not picking up those signals in your body and, mm -hmm. and reacting to them. But um, but if that if that antenna is turned off and you haven't tuned mm -hmm. it and you haven't like you're not been haven't been paying attention to it, yeah, it it it's it's sort of like our appendix, right? <laughs> like. We, that, it had a purpose at some point, but we stopped using it. Now it's just there, and you know, it doesn't do anything. Right, right. Well, our, our bodies are still there, so that's good. And we, we yes. can we can tune into that. Yeah, man, you're you're right with that. That. So to unpack that that mindfulness thing, like you were saying, you know, it's it's not about going off on some Eastern belief system. The way I understand it, the way I've experienced it, is that the power of mindfulness is is really the opportunity to become aware and to do that awareness with kindness right to not to to do it in such a way that i am am inviting myself back to the zone i like to call it just being in the zone and so the practices of meditation they do support that because the more i bring my nervous system into some sense of coherence and regulation the more i practice doing that ongoingly when i get into that situation where the trigger happens if my nervous system also has this other reference point for like oh yeah breathing and chilling out then i can access that easier right it doesn't mean i i have to be doing those practices to be able to access that but it does help it does help so it's not about having to now go have a yoga practice. However, yoga practice helps because it helps me get in touch with my body and what I'm feeling. But one could do that lots of other ways. People do it through running, people do it through climbing, people do it through hiking, right? Whatever helps me get my nervous system back into, when I say coherence, that's that sense of fluidity between heart and brain and body, and it doesn't feel jangly. <laughs> it feels smooth, right? Um, whatever I do to get myself back to that, whatever I do to have that be my balanced state, my natural resting state, it really helps when I get into those tough situations. Absolutely. And, you know, it also reminds me of the work that you're doing around is embodying things mm. and making experiences kinetic. Mm. And, you know, there's an awesome video of you that just got released. Well, it's going to be, this episode will be aired in, in probably four weeks or more, but, you know, the time of this recording it was just <laughs> released and it's really incredible I, I recommend people check it out because um you just using beach balls and, and with some very simple instructions <laughs> sent people down a path right and and then and then hitting the pause button and 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 asking people how they how they with the path they naturally went down and and what they didn't do Mm. and why they didn't behave in certain ways i think <laughs> you know it, and and this so this notion of like diving in physically to this game and how they just approached it and how they discussed approaching it even thinking about something they're about to engage in physically and mm -hmm. how they're going to go about it and unpacking that it's all very fascinating and i think it's not only i loved it because often these types of things are people just think of them as like punctuations or warm ups or get the energy up, but right. it taught a very distinct lesson and had a, a, a bigger purpose. And I think if we can if we can think about the how we bring physical elements into our workshops and mm -hmm. our practice in ways that are really meaningful, you know, I think that's a total Solomon move. <laughs> and would just love to hear how you're doing that work and if you have any tips for folks any any stuff you're finding with zoom that you might leave with them to kind of think about and how they might bring it into their practice sure man it's been such a it's been such a journey um doing this over zoom because as a more kinesthetically oriented facilitator you know it was almost like what you're cutting me off from my rooms and my people <laughs> being together doing this stuff because um, as you say, you know, that simple, simple beach balls and such, 
that because we are embodied uh, beings, because we're not just, you know, heads and brains, there's a whole system that is part of our learning process. And that whole system goes with us whenever we engage, whether that's a design session or a dialogue or a lesson plan, this whole somatic system goes with us. So how do I understand what I'm bringing in that somatic system? How do I reflect on it? How do I make choices about how I want to operate that? And how do I want that, how I want that system to operate? Um, so on Zoom, what I've been discovering is that, first of all, <laughs> most people, we've been conditioned, coming back to that word again, we've been conditioned, Douglas, that whenever there's a screen put in front of us, that we get into one posture, <laughs> and you can see me doing it now. That posture is sit, mouth slightly open, eyes a glaze, and just stare, somewhat comatose. <laughs> like we've been conditioned to do that, you know, just sit and watch TV. What's the TV pose? It's kind of like that, right? <laughs> so here we are, we're gonna start doing all this work in front of the TV. And most of us have been conditioned that that's, that's what we bring to it, to kind of sit in that pose. Well, that, that particular posture um, is not conducive to active brain and body integration. <clears throat> and so I started right away, like almost as soon as we, we went into quarantine, I was like, oh my gosh, what can we do that still engages this level of body somatic awareness as we're engaging with people over screens? And one of the core things that I discovered is, well, we got to do stuff that literally makes people stand up in their Zoom room which can at first feel like uncomfortable because we've been so conditioned. You sit down in front of a screen. But I've discovered that getting people to stand up and do things, and then, you know, we can talk more specifically about the details, and I'm happy to send out a PDF of these activities that I've gathered that are meaningful activities, and then some of them not so meaningful. They're just fun and they get the blood moving and the brain oxygen flow happening. But we get people up to do these activities, all of a sudden reconnects us in front of a screen with the other human beings because I'm being embodied. I'm not just sitting in that posture of comatose. Does that make sense? 100%. And, you know, I think the oxygen and blood flow stuff is very much in tune with the mindfulness and the you know body antenna stuff that we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier. Absolutely. Right? And I I am a big fan of functional movement and mm. I try to exercise as often as I can and whether that be Pilates or boxing or and most recently gotten really nice. into FRC, functional range conditioning. Wow. And I think one Break of the that thing, down for a moment, because I've never heard that. Yeah. So I'm a, I, I will because I'm I think it ties back to what we are talking about in a really fascinating way. So functional range conditioning was created by a chiropractor who was starting to realize that a lot of the standard adjustment techniques weren't helping people fix themselves in the long term. But a lot of times the problems weren't structural, they were neurological. Oh. So our connection to our body was disturbed in some way. And mm -hmm. so our brain literally shut down the pathways because we weren't using it or because there was an injury yeah. and they were trying to protect it. So the brain was really clever about bypassing something because we have um, a lot of our smaller stabilizer muscles can be overpowered by some of our bigger muscles. Sure, sure. Like a lot, a lot of our um, rot rotator cuff muscles can be controlled like some of those movements could be done with our tricep and our bicep, although it's not as huh. efficient or elegant, right? Right. And so, so this is a combination of isometric contractions, which means that I don't have any load on it, but I'm gonna con I'm gonna contract the muscle huh. with just like my control of that neurological pathway, so I can just hold my, my arm out and contract my bicep without actually lifting any weight, you know? Yes. And then also you can put yourself into um, extreme positions, like as far as your hamstring can, um, from, can flex, and then you isometrically contract. What that's doing is it's training the, the brain to control those muscles in those, in those ranges that, in your extreme ranges. And wow. what, what it does is it reduces the 
the, the distance between your flexibility and your mobility, well, giving yourself more mobility so you can like move into your flexibility under control versus wow. just someone pulling like you kind of taking a strap and pulling yourself into a, a, a bigger stretch. You can actually yeah. move further into that, which means you have more neurological control over your body and your muscles. And so I've, as you were talking about becoming Dude, more aware of your body, that's totally and it. Speaking you, <laughs> that's it is totally the same it. stuff. It's the same work. It's just, I'm, I'm doing it physically and tricking the brain. The other way is doing it mindfully and trying to tell the brain, like pick up on what the body's telling me. So it's the, it's like, it's, it's the yin to the yang almost. That's beautiful. I mean, you just, you just named to me a whole nother element of what mindfulness is, what you just described there. Um, it is that connection. It is that kind of practice. That's fabulous. FRC. Nice. Yeah. It's a really amazing system. And I, I big fan of it and the show notes. We'll make sure there's a link to the PDF of your somatic embodiment activities. <laughs> right. And then we'll also have a link to some video, some FRC videos. Because nice. I highly recommend people have a physical practice, um, active meditation, if you will, as well as like other types of meditation and then also like what are the tools that we can get people out of this comatose zoom pose? <laughs> right on i'm so with you on that and if there's you know if you start your meeting off you start your facilitating process off with even some, i imagine some of those frc exercises there's there's just a, a plethora there's really a, a, an almost unlimited number of these exercises these activities if you want to call them that that can only they don't even have to take very long you know if you're really watching that agenda time they can take 30 to 60 seconds and yet the impact that they have is like you're saying gets us out of that state gets me more engaged gets me more feeling and sensing even across this zoom medium so solomon it's been a pleasure chatting with you today and i know yeah. that like we could go on for much much longer because <laughs> it's so much fun but I just want to take a moment and give you an opportunity to leave our listeners with some parting thoughts and, and maybe let them know how to, how to find you or how to, how to dig deeper into your work. Um, any, any final thoughts? Thank you. Well, you can find me at sourceconsultinggroup.com. That's the easiest place to find, easiest place to find me. And closing thoughts, you know, I really believe that we are in this intense experience right now to access the tools that we've been talking about, experimenting with, practicing to create breakthrough. I mean, here it is, one of the, the potentially globally most challenging times that we've faced. And, and, and it's facing that on so many levels, whether you're talking about the pandemic, the political experience, the, the intensity around a race that's happening right now. And this is such that moment that we can bring our best selves through these practices. I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about engaging the practices that we know are generative, that bring our best selves forward especially as it pertains to having that deeper complex dialogues that are just so necessary right now. And I just believe that we've been given this opportunity to do so, to evolve ourselves as humanity. Here we are, right? Let's do this. Let's bring it into our bodies. Let's bring it out into the world. And um, I just feel this is the moment we can look back and say, man, I use that time to do that. So I'm um, inviting us <laughs> i'm inviting us to be there to look back on 2020 and like as intense as it is what breakthrough did we bring to it and i really feel like you know the platforms you're bringing douglas and and having conversations like this um, are such a part of that so thank you solomon it's been a pleasure thanks for joining me on the show thank you so much for having me always a delight Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com